everyone. Good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam um, for everyone. Greeting for everyone. Where where are you? Where um, uh, where you are? And it's really my honor to be here. Thank you to CMU Sand who always involving me and also in this uh, event was very uh, important and really appreciate that uh, CMU and uh, the uh, CMU Sand is really. Uh, have a great attention to children with visual impairment and uh, learning disability. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I would like to uh, share what uh, I've been uh, experiencing on working with the children. And I think that I also will learn uh, so much from you. And I know that you are coming from all the Asian countries. So it is really honor uh, to meet uh, you here all of you here and I really wish that we could meet face to face and really can learn each other. Uh, but uh, thank you so much. So uh, can I share my uh, screen for now? Okay, so if Ask I talk clear. very fast, just remind me, all right? And uh, I want to make sure that everyone also understand as you know that uh, English is not my native <laughs> as all of us here so uh, might be my pronunciation is not really good so just let me know right okay so during this course uh, we will explore the nature of student with visual impairment and learning disability and what are their needs actually and what we can uh, do to find uh, the potential? How do we create a future? And how do we develop a curi appropriate curriculum uh, for them? What are some important considerations to choose the appropriate program for the student? And in the end, uh, you will have opportunity to work in a group. So uh, hopefully that, that it really um, you can uh, discuss with the uh, with the group, although might be a little bit challenged, but I'm sure that this is something that uh, uh, that is really good for all of you. So um, I would say before I really uh, start this um, uh, course further, I would like to ask you to think about one of the student with MDVI, I call here MDVI, like a children with a visual impairment and learning disability. So I just make it short as MDVI, that you currently work uh, in your school and write his or her name on a piece of paper. Okay, just make sure put next to you, write the name of the one student that you're thinking about. And I want you to think through um, uh, to think about this student during uh, this course. And please think some positive things about this student. As a teacher, it is important to identify our challenges and look for support and resources. When it's come to the student, thinking of a positive side about the student is a more important rather than his or her inability or weaknesses. So let's consider the student you are thinking of and what are some the positive aspects. For example, can he or she walk? Can he or she control his movement? Can he or she move the hands or part of the arms or fingers? Can he sit properly? Yeah, maybe he can, uh, he still have some vision or uh, some hearing. Even if he or she only can move their eyes. Thinking about the positive aspect of the student will motivate, uh, will, will motivate uh, and allow us to dream for this future. Dreaming freely, thinking out of the box will guide us to find solution instead of a desperate, a desperation. So do you dare to dream about their future? In the next slide, I will introduce you to some of the students and I want you to consider whether you have a student with similar characteristic in your school or in your classroom. 
Each learner is unique and they has unique gifts to share to the world and challenges to overcome. Learner with, student, learner with visual impairment and learning disability have a vision impairment and different uh, combination of additional disability. So uh, let's take a look for some uh, children here. Okay. So this boy loves cooking, shopping, and also talking to adults. When he cooks, he follow the uh, picture recipe. In this picture, he is 14 years old and he can't read, he cannot read. Um, he communicates by using the pictures and sign language, just simple sign language, such a gesture. He speaks, but only a few people can understand his speech. As you see, he has low vision uh, and also intellectual disability. And this cute girl loves to help her friends share her snacks and loves to comfort her friends who don't feel good or who are upset. She moves her, um, she moves her wheelchair in a way and she does a lot of activity daily, daily living herself and sometimes with minimum support. She reads simple words uh, with large print, uh, but she only speaks a few words. So she is considered as children with multiple disability uh, and visual impairment. So I would like to share this short videos of other children. And uh, she just learned to communicate, to express what she actually need. I would like you to really pay attention to how the teacher offer, uh, offer a choices to her and how long the teacher wait and see how the children respond and how the, the teacher actually responded after that, all right? So this uh, uh, girl in this um, video is totally blind. She doesn't speak. She hear, but she doesn't speak. Do you want to eat or do you want to drink? Did you wait? Do you want to eat or do you want to drink? And he sort of touch the ball, but not sure. Beautiful. Oh, you want to drink. Look at how the teacher uh, used the child hand, guide the, 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 the student. Okay, so this student also considered a student with visual impairment and um, multiple uh, disability. Okay, and now we are moving to the next student. So I give you a lot of um, a sample of different student because because this condition is really spectrum. So if you see the picture here in the picture is uh, a student who are communicating by sign language, 
but the way they sign is by touching each other on their hands. The boy on the left in the picture is 12 years old and he reads braille. He, he attends the four grade national curriculum and it's for regular student. He does a sub hub independently and he goes shopping in the uh, a mini market uh, nearby the school by himself. He uses a flashcard uh, with a print to communicate to people who don't sign. And in the uh, right, uh, uh, so this boy in the lab is totally blind and totally deaf. While the boy in the right side is totally deaf, totally deaf, is totally deaf and also has low vision. He loves drawing and also painting. And both of them we call as a deaf blind. Okay, so uh, this is just easiest way uh, for us to talk about uh, the some possible combination of children with visual impairment and additional disability. So if you see um, that the main um, um, uh, the main problem for them is visual impairment, but it doesn't mean that this is the dominant. It doesn't mean that this is the most severe uh, for. Uh, among the other disability, but there must be visual impairment and uh, other disability. It could be the hearing impairment or could be other condition, uh, health condition, maybe a motor challenge, maybe speech disorder, maybe intellectual disability and other possibility. It could be um, one or two or even more. Uh, the vision loss uh, can arrange for low vision uh, to, to, to totally blind. And uh, the hearing loss can range from being hard of hearing to severe hearing loss. And for the intellectual disability, can range from mild to severe or to prolonged uh, profound uh, intellectual challenge. And the fine and gross motor challenge can range from not being able to uh, hold a pencil um, to not able to use their hands and uh, the gross motor challenge can range from um, not walking or walking with the lame to needing a wheelchair and the medical challenge can range from the short-term illness to the uh, debilitating life condition and it is important to remember that all learners are unique and these are such a spectrum so as a teacher, our role, our role is not to diagnose uh, them or call them of how many disability they have, but to see carefully who this child is. What can they do? What do they like? What potential do they have? So we don't look at what is not right about the kids and try to fix it or to cure it. Instead, we work to optimize their potential and minimize their weaknesses. All right, so that is really truly our role as a teacher. So when we talk about the definition, so this is the definition um, of uh, this population that we are discussed today. But I want you, um, all of us, to highlight some words, some important word here in this definition. So it says that um, these children are um, the MDV and the band are diverse and have unique needs. And they all share challenges in a communication. So they have or everybody have the challenge in communication. And that's impact to the ability to build family and social relationship as well as access to the community and a general education curriculum. So what it does mean, it's mean a lot for us as a teacher. It says that every child are different. A child, it says that some of their challenges and, and this is our role, how to support them to overcome the challenges. And it says that 
they need the um, uh, special curriculum because they cannot access the general education curriculum. So really that learners with um, um, that we're talking uh, today, they need the special uh, support so, um, so that they could achieve the equal access to education and the quality of life uh, offered and um, um, so that could be equally to children without disability. So I hope that everybody here agree to, uh, to this, that it's not only the, the definition, but understanding like what is the impact being um, children with multiple disability and what can we do, right? So what I can say is, and I, will, I would like to invite you, is to remember this. No matter what, all the children are unique and all the children can learn. Every children can learn. And all the children can communicate. Maybe they communicate in a different way, not like us, but every child can communicate. And we have to be aware that families and also the care uh, caregivers are the most important people in the child lives. This means that we have to work, partnership, collaborate with the families. And our children deserve the opportunities to reach their highest potential. And this is our role to provide the opportunities, to help them, to support them so that they have the quality of life in the future. So we are going to move to the um, our next uh, topic, but I really, I really, I would like to uh, really um, uh, invite you to always keep in mind the slide that we um, we discussed before that I saw you right now, because this is the basic of our work. Um, this is the uh, core that keep us remember to always have a, um, a positive belief and have the dream about the kids. So after we knew about the kid a little bit, let's talk about the impact of um, having, having the visual uh, loss and also multiple disability. So as we know, for most of people like us, the 80% of the information received from the environmental is perceived by our vision. And our senses are working together to have complete information about an object, for instance. So seeing when we learn about new object, we see, then we touch, we may shake to know if the uh, object produces the sound, we may smell and then we taste it. And then that's how we learn about the new object, right? And then we have a complete information about an object. And that is how we learn about the whole concept of those objects. So what will happen when our vision is not functioning? In addition, are the senses that also may not functioning properly, right? Because they have multiple disability. So the combined sensory loss bring a huge impact to the development and also to the learning process and to the life of the student. So let's review all these challenges. Okay, so in the slide, you see a picture of two uh, students with multiple disabilities and both um, a low vision. And they have a conversation about an object. So these are the challenges of a children's um, weight, MDVI, and also deafblind and other multiple disability that they have challenge to trust people and build relationship. They have challenges communication, communication and a challenging and emotion and isolation, as well as the forming meaningful concept. Lots of our children have a negative experience in their relationship with people. 
this might happen due to misunderstanding and frustration. If you have severe disabled students who look who lack of communication skill, um, think of how many times that you leave them alone in the open space. Have you ever done that? Or think of how many times that you pull their hands and bring um, uh, them to a different place without letting them know in advance. Or, you know, it's just pull and then not letting them where you're going. Maybe they also have experience being touched by others on their face, you know, without, without knowing anything before. Or somebody probably just give them food without letting the child know before, without anticipation. So this can be terrifying for them and eventually they will lose their trust to other people. Many of these kids don't communicate verbally. They don't speak and they don't sign. Or if they speak sometimes, they don't understand what is the meaning. Or some kid may be just imitated other people uh, 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 talk when other people talk, right? So some of them don't understand that people can be fun and can be supportive to them. And this is why that make them don't trust to people, right? Everyone, including these children, have a feeling. So it is very important for us to express our feeling and to be understood by others. The most powerful, powerful uh, way to express our feeling is through words. And many of these children do not have right way to express their feeling. And simply because they don't have words. And adults often don't aware about the situation. And then they just ignore the children's feelings. But feeling is very abstract, but everyone can felt, including these children. As everyone, um, we, we can be very happy when um, um, yeah, we can be very happy and feel good when uh, uh, we when we felt our feeling being understood, right? And um, on the other hand, we can be frustrated and when no one care of our feelings. At least I feel terrible when people not really understand me, right? So these children uh, might uh, always be in this situation, uh, challenging emotion for the children might be like isolation, uh, mistrust, um, anxiety, frustration, loneliness, confusion, and uh, other uh, negative feeling. So, for children who are MDI, the world is only what they experienced that which um, uh, within they reach. And um, the, the learner perception on the world is what, what is only within his reach and experience. So they, we learn concept through our experience and concepts are actually beyond a word beyond um, uh, just a speech or just a word. There are important concepts in, uh, in the world uh, of our children and also in our world. Um, they need to learn about concept of people, um, places, activities, feelings, and also concept of things. For us, our world become bigger every time when we learn new concepts. But these children have limited access, limited access to learn about the concept. And concept is something that, that is really abstract for them. So now 
we're going to see um, what is the impact of this sensory loss to the natural learning. Um, most of the children learn through the visual sense by imitating what they see. And uh, this constant visual stimulation and, um, and the, the, visual, the constant visual uh, stimulation is actually encouraged movement and exploration and then curiosity. But when they suffer from the condition that cause visual impairment and additional disability, this experience is unlimited and they can uh, present different challenges. So most of uh, what the children learned, typical children learned, actually they learned, they never learned at school. They learn through natural, to, um, in the natural way by seeing others, hearing and interacting with others in the flow uh, of the uh, daily life. So we are going to uh, discuss the impact of uh, being uh, MDBA deaf blind, and um, we we um, and from the first day um, uh, from our life, uh, actually we rely on the senses of uh, to give us the information we need and to travel and understand the world. That that is the nature um, a way out of how we learn, but the information only received by learner with MDBA uh, uh, is not is not complete, it's just partial. It's distorted and uh, unreliable and fleeting. And the learner can learn when given the right intervention and access to the environment. And that is part of our role. And uh, without the intervention to access what they face in and endured a disability, and um, this can be a real problem for uh, these children. Right. So maybe I need to pause uh, here. If there is any one, raise the hand, or if there is any question, so far. No? Okay. Um, having a better understanding of uh, the impact on learning and development uh, that is disability can have is a key to giving uh, the type of support to the student and to read their full potential uh, toward a life that is uh, independent as much as possible. And the impact that uh, impairment may have on learning and development can vary according to the severity of the condition or sometimes on the, on the diagnosis and also prognosis. Time of uh, the life when the disability develop or when uh, the disability occurs, uh, is it congenital or it has happened later, um, that will be really affected. Also, it depends on the cultural uh, environment and the socioeconomic uh, level. And then also uh, access to the appropriate educational and rehabilitation service. And of course, the presence of the additional disabilities uh, as well. If the children has many disabilities, of course, it will impact it to uh, the child, how the child learn. So this means that the children uh, of the same age and with the same uh, diagnosis can have the different um, uh, and, and have the visual performances and diverse educational uh, needs based on their uh, un uh, unique characteristics. So everyone is really different and the education also could be, um, the, the, the growth uh, and the education approach could be different from uh, each one. So these are the lists uh, of the, um, the impact of the learning and the development. Yeah, there is a communication skill, um, uh, intellectual development, motor development, social and play development, sensory processing disorder, behavioral issue, self-esteem, uh, self sorry, of course, and uh, independence. 
children can have difficulties with concept development and uh, abstract thought that can affect their intellectual development. And students also um, can present a delay of the motor and postural development uh, because they, they might uh, have lack of uh, incentive and to initiate movement. A lot of our children just, you know, um, uh, stay uh, quiet and um, afraid to move. And um, there are similar reasons that, you know, sometimes we see that the child see a uh, shiny toys uh, in the room and some of them are motivated uh, to move. But for the children who are totally blind and cannot hear, there is no motivation for them to move, right? Because there is no uh, stimulation at all. There is no reason for them to move. And there are also that they can have a late development of a head and control, head a posture, like for the babies, um, they, they, uh, the, the typical babies, they are let off their head because they want to see something uh, better. But for these children with visual impairment, don't have the reason to do that. So we often see that they, they have a delay in the development. This is when we bet um, or face it when they were very young, um, but this is what affected to their uh, life um, uh, later. All right. Um, the lack of vision also can uh, affect, affect the way of uh, children interact with others and play with the peers. If a child uh, cannot see, what are the children are doing? So the, the children cannot see what are the, the uh, children are doing. And, and we know that children learn from other children, right? But this opportunity cannot happen to children with visual impairment. And um, then they're not motivated to join, of course, because they do not know what other children are doing, right? Um, so a lot of time that our children just be quiet and cornered than if they're in the uh, regular school because they really do not know what is happening. And this can, this can cause the difficulties on making friends, um, engaging in, engaging, uh, engage in the uh, elaborate uh, play and um, to become involved in the role playing or pretend a uh, play. This is not happened uh, to, the, to the children. So if you are in the mainstream school, and um, there is no uh, effort uh, for the, um, from the environment to support this uh, child, this child might just sit in the corner. So children may also have a sensory processing disorder or originally called a sensory uh, integration dysfunction. And this is a neurological uh, disorders in which the sensory information that the individual is actually perceived uh, in abnormal uh, response. So this often includes uh, over uh, responsiveness, yeah, or under uh, responsiveness. So it could be access or it could be lacking um, when there is a sensory stimulation. So the student um, uh, can be feel overstimulated or uh, distracted uh, by the object or people easily. And um, they can have the difficulties when finding the object in the uh, clutter uh, drawer, for instance, or they, can, um, uh, they cannot uh, see um, um, the word that, that is uh, uh, see a picture that is really clutter in the uh, uh, book, for instance even if they're low vision. So when we understand, or sometimes when uh, uh, children, a lot of children uh, have the problem understanding about the picture, a symbol in the worksheet, for instance, um, because of this uh, clutter, uh, clutter. And when reading facial expression and nonverbal language, these children don't have uh, understanding uh, about that. And, uh, oh, they don't have the um, depth uh, deep perception uh, about facial expression or uh, about uh, uh, a nonverbal language. For them, this is too abstract. Okay. So let uh, us get to um, go to the 
uh, each uh, picture in this slide. Uh, and also I try to uh, explain what is that mean uh, about some uh, difficulties in the uh, life of the children. First, that they uh, have the difficulty to assess the environment uh, in this day, in this um, uh, time is about the mobility. Uh, as we know that the mobility is defined as a knowing where you are in the space, where you want to go uh, and the ability to plan how to get there. The start of uh, this skill is actually happened at, um, in a very young age. And we know that when, when the child, um, the typical child is begin to explore the environment that is close at them uh, when they are young and then it's go farther. And this skill actually involves the sensory awareness on the body image and the special concept and concept that divine who and where you are in the relationship of the object and then uh, the people uh, in the environment. So the sighted child uh, sees something in the environment and it is modified to get it. Um, they have the sensory awareness and the body image and can plan to move to get that object, for, for example. And that is not happen to children with visual impairment. And for the MDVI a learner, um, uh, particularly, the path to the independent through mobility has many uh, barriers, starting with sensory awareness. If the learner cannot see or hear well, he doesn't know what is in the environment uh, in order to be motivated to move and to find it. And uh, this MDV learner has issue in uh, developing an understanding of a senses uh, of self and also body awareness. And these are the paramount teaching strategies uh, that developed by uh, Dr. Zan Jan Pandit, uh, who educational theorist of teaching with multiple uh, disability um, and, and also learner uh, with a deaf band. Uh, the sense of body awareness um, is one key that, that we have to uh, always kind of put in, in, in the curriculum. And um, it takes a long time to build this skill uh, to the children. The spatial concepts are critical uh, to the learner who is uh, MDVI in deaf band. Um, the form of a foundation for building who you are and where you are in relationship to the environment and also the rest of the world. So this is one of the challenges of uh, being uh, children with visual impairment and learning disability. So the second here is you see a child, a picture of a child while walking and then suddenly uh, see the water and then he um, bent uh, the body and then washed uh, the head uh, with the water, yeah. So the second big thing, it can be impact to be MDV as that lack of incidental learning. What does that mean? So this picture is really excellent uh, a sample of incidental learning. So I would think that probably this child heard and saw the water and came out, uh, came up with this uh, real cool idea. And actually, I really doubt that any adult show him how to do this, bend uh, and then uh, wet uh, the, um, the head, right, the, the hair. So he used his vision uh, naturally, he has motivation to explore and with his creativity experimentation, he had a nice fun and interesting access uh, to, the, to his environment. Right, and he learned something. He learned new thing. So it is not that the learner with MDVI would come with the same activity. They may not know what to do with that, right? So it is just that he hadn't known that the water was there. Some some kid maybe even not know if because they cannot see and they cannot hear. Some some of them maybe they do not know if there is water over there. So we as a teacher 
should allow our learner to experience the complete environment by telling and showing them what are some opportunities that are available in the, in, uh, the environment. So keep showing them what is in the environment, keep talking to them, keep allow them to explore so that they learn uh, about the environment. So like uh, what mother has not observed their child uh, say and do something like, where did, where did it come from? So we have to show the children where something is come from. We need to tell the, uh, we, would, we need to invite the children to take their own plate for the sun before they eat. Rather than just let the child sit and then the food will come. They need to learn where to take the plate. They need to learn where the food come from so that they learn uh, uh, an object, so that they learn uh, many concepts. So the incident by learning is something that the children learn naturally by seeing. That is the, the uh, natural learning for children who has vision. But for the children who doesn't have the vision, they don't learn this um, thing naturally. We need to teach them about everything that the children who can see learn by themselves. But for the children with visual impairment, we have to teach. And particularly to children with visual impairment and additional disability, everything. Another challenge for them is that they have lack of incidental, incidental uh, social interaction. So in this picture, uh, a good sample of there are three girls. Um, two girls are actually playing with an object. And then uh, there is a, a girl a back um, in the back. See, what is the two kids actually uh, play uh, with, right? So it is incidental learning um, for uh, this girl in the back is incidental social interaction because he, she didn't really um, uh, on purpose see that, but then, but then she just saw it and then she learned. She learned how these two girls interacting. She learned that the children have the conversation, and this is something that huge um, uh, a process and huge experience um, that will. Uh, influence them, uh, her mind. But this is not happening with the children with MDVA or with the visual impairment. They do not know what is happening around. They do not know if there are other children or other people doing something. So this, is a, this information is being cut. There is no way, unless you, us, for teacher, is actually helping the children, letting the, the, the children with visual impairment and additional disability know what are other people doing. Right. So then the uh, other things that is impacting to the learning process of the children is a social uh, development. So most family want their child to have friends. Everyone wants to have friends, right? And the learners who have MDVI often have challenges making friends whether with a classmate um, or with other children um, in, uh, in their neighborhood. Simply because they don't have the, uh, a way to communicate and some, uh, some of them have a nonverbal communication so they don't have a, a way to interact with, with other children. So communication is a key uh, to developing the social relationship. Now, if you back to your student, one that you wrote on the name and, um, you know, in the first slide before, think, do they have, how do they communicate? Do they communicate just using the speech where everybody understand? Or do they communicate differently only few people who understand? Or are they just probably pointing or pulling uh, you to have, to have uh, him doing something? If that's happened, we have to think like how to making sure that everybody knows what, what he's trying to say, right? 
Otherwise, they have a very small word and uh, don't have the friend. So it is critical for us to understand. It is, it is critical for us to understand what our student communication uh, mode or communication form. What are the function and the reason of uh, the, the, uh, the, the student actually communicate? For example, uh, one a child may lift um, his head and smile. Uh, that means I want attention. And uh, maybe other children, like, you know, just, just um, waving the hand, say, no, I don't like it. Right. Okay. All right. There is a discussion happening. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so it really try to to understand what the child try to say if they can speak, even if they only do the gesture, even if they are only pointing, if oh, even if they only do the vocalization, but they try to come to their mind and try to understand if he can speak, what he's trying to say, right? And then the other big problem, big impact to be MDVS like to build the concept. Concept development, can be challenging for these children, even if they can speak. Not all of them understand truly what, they, they, what are they speaking. Even if the kid may say like elephant, but it doesn't mean that they really understand what 11 is, right? So this is story of four um, blind men. You can, you can add five or six actually, <laughs> who touch, uh, touching about the Eleven, and they illustrated. You know, uh, this uh, this picture can um, describe uh, what is the the difficulties that the student with MDVI or people who are visual impairment developing the meaningful concept. But what is actually concept? Concept are the ideas that give meaning to our world. We develop concept based upon our a particular experience. So here actually um, uh, the story about this uh, uh, blind, for blind men with the elephant is that each blind man have the entire different experience about the elephant. Uh, but um, so we understand that they have a different concept about the elephant. And those are concepts that build based on their own experience, which is not wrong because that's, those are what they experience. So let's see what is the, the, the story. Okay. So there are four of blind men and each uh, people have to touch part of the uh, elephant. So they're not touching a hole, but they touch one person touch in the tail, one a person touch in the a body, and other only touch um, the feet, other people touch in the trunk, etc. Right? And this is what, what they come about the ideas of, um, of an elephant. So, People who touch the, the trunk, yeah, uh, say that, oh, an elephant is like a thick wiggling thing, yeah? And then the other person who touch the body says, no, an elephant is like a big brick of wall, yeah? And then the other people say, one who touch the leg, well, I'm sure an elephant is like a big tree. And then 
the one who uh, touched the ears say, no. An elephant is like a big leathery fan. And the one who touched the tail say, how could you all be so wrong? I think an elephant is like hanging, swinging rope. Aren't they all correct? Right? All the parts that um, were described uh, by them were correct, but they do not represent the whole elephant. So if, if we uh, uh, imagine the elephant based on the experience, the elephant, the elephant will be like this. Is it really like elephant that we normally see? No, but this is what they experience. So it is important for us to allow them to explore the whole object rather than only part of the object. And it is important for us to allow the child to have the real object, but not the um, uh, imitation, because it's totally different. Right, I hope. I hope that this is not only story. Maybe uh, this is not um, new for you, for some of you. But for me, this is something that I always remember. When I work with these children, I have to make sure to really allow the child to explore everything. And I have to remember that my role is to build a concept, right? So it's not only just, OK, um, just pass this and then, and then done. OK, move to the other student, pass this. Here the object and then done because then I'm not there the concept. I'm just doing my lesson, but I'm not changing their mind. Right? So now another uh, um, a challenge of being MDVI or the impact of the MDVI is that the motor development. So we use our vision, hearing, and fine and gross motor uh, capability to connect with people, right? Those, those skills is to connect with, with people, with object and with our environment. And the complex uh, effects are created by them who loses of the vision and um, hearing. And it it's may a further have the further complication complicated by the learner who also have the motor challenge. So imagine if they have the uh, vision problem, uh, have the hearing problem, but also have the motor problem, right? The a daily consideration uh, activity by activity must be given the, to the placement of the material to use to adapt uh, adaptive material and also motor technique. So, and that, that is what, what we should do. It is a critical component of working with the learners uh, who are MDVI dumpling is to uh, make the adaptation and uh, modification of the environment. And this is uh, should happen um, throughout the day uh, when the student learn uh, with us. So as the teacher, uh, we must become environment engineering, yeah, engineers. <laughs> we must be uh, creative and uh, to see what is the possible. We have to consider about what is the size so that the children can see. Uh, what is the color, the contrast, the lighting? Um, you know, uh, uh, making sure that everything will be accessible uh, for uh, the children so that they could learn uh, faster or better. So we must be very careful about the loudness and also the softness of the sound um, and um, in the environment. I often come to the school, um, special school, um, which can be fun for some children because like one uh, classroom play your music, another uh, the, the classroom next by doing math, 
or doing a work on the table. And of course, this is so difficult for the, for the children. So uh, we must be really aware, like when we have the classroom, how we can um, really reduce the sound and making sure that it's not, it's not become a disruptor uh, for the kid. And also the lighting. Some uh, school have the uh, uh, two windows in their um, uh, left and right, and it's really open windows. And it's hard for some kid who are low vision, but sometimes it's not difficult to modify. Just put the carton. And sometimes you don't have it, just put the uh, uh, paper, large paper, and then it solves your problem. But this critical thinking that we have to, um, to be able to do it and, uh, and have to be conscious with, with everything when we work with this kid. Um, so in this picture, there is a, a kid, yeah, who actually just crawling and then suddenly see um see the mirror and then while seeing the mirror see uh, see her face and she smiled to it and there is feedback and then she also curious she try to touch so there are series of learning that we can see from the picture series of learning only the child child this child move a little bit and then she discover something uh, new and that also develop um, the areas of uh, development. So she's motivated uh, by looking at her image um, in her of herself in the mirror. So she used uh, her mobility to reach the mirror and is developing her uh, motor curiosity, right? Who's there? So, but the children with a visual impairment um, and additional disability, then don't have that skill. So they lose this opportunity. Um, and it's affected a lot because only from uh, the movement, then when she move uh, further, that's actually develop the motor skill even better. And then when she see in the mirror and then uh, she learn about the facial expression and then she's thinking like, who's that? It's about the cognition. And then she imitate a lot of things like curiosity and other is about the cognition scale. And it's happened only because she moved and she can see, right? Okay. Okay, I'll stop here. Is there any question before I move? This is just kind of brief um, information for you to really kind of um, think about our student. And then when you really understand about this, then you can think how to support them by understanding their needs, their challenge, the problem. And then we really can creatively think, what can I do to support them? Okay, is there any problem so far? So, no? Okay, so then I will continue. So we learn about a lot of things. It seems to be that the children have a lot of problem. How could we have? Oh, I have a lot of, I have student who has a lot of problem. Can I have expectation for the student? Of course, because I was saying before, and I invite you to believe that all children can learn. And we want to have a dream about that. We want our learned, uh, our student to have this. We want them to have the high quality of life. And quality of life for everyone means this for this four areas. We want our children to have the best quality which uh, of life they deserve. We want them to a uh, life as independent as possible. To love is to have friendship 
and relationship with others. To work uh, means to have a sense of purpose in their life. They should able to contribute and give to others. And to play is to enjoy um, uh, our free time and have fun things to do, right? So these are to live, to love, to work, to play are a foundation of our curriculum, are a philosophy of the education of children with multiple disability. It's like simple, yeah? But it's really meaningful and it's, it's really rich of possibility. So, because we want that the children will have happy, healthy, fulfilling lives that are no different than anybody else. Isn't that that what we all are looking for life is this, right? To be happy and healthy, um, to be able to do something that is meaningful for us. And the children, including them who are multiple disability, should have the opportunity to have the same and they can't. So this is what we want in their life and how we could support them to reach that. One thing as a teacher that we have to really think to bring these children to this, to this, the happy life is to have the uh, appropriate curriculum for them. So next we will discuss like what is curriculum that I would like to offer to you. And also some challenges to select the appropriate curriculum for the student. And then what is the suitable curriculum for the student? So these are the, um, the um, uh, topic, the issue that we are going to discuss in the next slide. I hope it's not really boring for you. Um, I aware uh, when I came to the school and it's not only in Indonesia, uh, but also um, in other Asian country that I learned and these are some, a problem that commonly um, a teacher or educator uh, actually think before they really understand that there, are, there is a, some appropriate uh, curriculum for them. So first that um, some of them uh, say that uh, the curriculum for these children is disability. So for instance, if the student uh, have the visual impairment, okay, my internet say it doesn't uh, unstable. Okay, so some teachers say that the curriculum that they choose for the student is based on the primary disability. So for instance, if the student um, deaf and totally deaf and low vision, then they will use the uh, curriculum for the deaf, right? And then the second, some teachers say that they combine the several curriculum based on their disability. So if the children has two disability in the same time, uh, which is visual impairment and learning disability, for instance, they will combine this curriculum. So I cannot imagine if the student is visual impairment, have the a little bit of hearing impairment, and then also a, a CP for instance, how many curriculum that they will combine, yeah? Um, is really difficult for the teachers, but also is really confusing for the uh, student. It seems to be that uh, it's expected and that the children with uh, multiple disability even smarter than other children because they have to do all the curriculum, right? And this is what we also uh, find in, in the school. 
other teacher say that they reduce the curriculum content according to the perception. So often when I ask like, which curriculum uh, this student actually attend? And a teacher always say like, oh, I just reduced um, the curriculum. And when we ask like how to reduce the curriculum, like, and what is the, the actual level? And only few people can answer. So yeah, this, this, is, this is also a lot that, that we found uh, in the school. Others say that um, some teacher has to use two curriculum. This is the teacher who already aware that the children need the different curriculum. They know the uh, IP, so they make the uh, curriculum or the program based on the child, um, uh, uh, the child um, current level, yeah. But because sometimes the, the government or uh, the authority asking for the administrative work or the, the um, to show them the curriculum that they work with. So they make the two a different curriculum or two different program. One is for the government or, or for the authority report. One is the actual um, uh, curriculum for the student. So I see that there are a lot of uh, um, uh, ways, but unfortunately, these are not the way we choose the right curriculum for children with multiple disabilities. So before we learn of this curriculum with the student, so last thing, what does curriculum mean? I don't know if this is also familiar uh, for you or if you ever heard this a problem in the field, but these are definitely what we learned uh, so far in um, many countries. So when we talk about the curriculum, first is about what? So curriculum is simple, it's about what? What means we have to think about what is the ultimate goal of the education for this specific student? When the student graduate, what do you want this a student be? And that is can be considered, we have to think right now, then what is the, the curriculum for him? And then second is about um, what we want when they grown up. Maybe they can't right now when they're little, 10 years old, five years old, coming out of classroom. But we have to be able to visualize, to, to image when they are down, when they're 20 years old, when they're 22 years old, what is our dream? Are they gonna the, um, the young men who will depend on the family? Are they going to be the um, young adult who will live in the community and be part of the community or something else? So we have to create the future in, of this student in our mind. And that's become one of our curriculum consideration or reason. We have to think about what the children should achieve in the next six months, next five years, next 10 years, in the next 15 years. So we have to really kind of thinking all of this to create the what, to create what are we going to teach to our student? What is important today, tomorrow, and in the future of this kid? By looking what the child has right now and imagining what is the future of this kid. So for me, curriculum is this. For me, curriculum is what are we going to teach to the student? For me, curriculum is not set of a document. For me, it's what is in the student and what are me and parent dreaming about this future, the future of the student. So another thing, curriculum is also how. Mean, 
how to know about the, the child um, abilities right now. Mean like the curriculum is mean understanding to find or to explore what the child potential, to find the current ability, and to think about the any areas or the condition that impact the child learning process. We just learned before about the, um, the impact of the child learning process of students with multiple disabilities. And those are general impact. But you may see it can me have slightly different, right? So this is when we think of how, it's really kind of hard to set up our program by thinking what the children have right now, what is the impact of the visual condition or hearing condition or motor condition or other things. And then also think about what the child like and dislike. What is the, um, the opportunity the child like, uh, have? What is the, the environment and the family can offer to support the education of this uh, of the kid? So all the resources that we have and the student has around, that can be um, um, an important consideration that we have to think when we, when we set up the program or the curriculum for the student. Then the other thing when we think about how is how to implement this, uh, this thought, this dream, to achieve this dream. Think about the strategy. And we're going to have to talk about the teaching strategy later. Think about the media. Think about, do I need to use the a real object? Do I need to use the picture? Do I need to use what? And that, um, that is uh, based on the uh, current level of the student. Think about the place and the environment where we, we will teach the student about that specific skill. Environment means it's really the, the, the place, but also the people, yeah? Uh, but also other people mean what the skill that the people should have to um, to uh, teach the student. I'm sorry, my cat is being so fussy right now. Uh, and definitely that she communicate to me. I think that she, say, she is saying that I want to go out, right? So I believe that uh, that all the children communicate, even the cat is communicate. Sorry about that. And also think about who is involved. And definitely we as a teacher have fully involved in any ways to, to uh, achieve or to the process or the student education. But don't forget about the family because family is um, the important theme that needs to be with us and need to be with the student during the process of our learning or education. Then when we think about the how is really, how do we measure about what we teach? It's about evaluation, right? So if we have, uh, have um, uh, really a detail, but very specific IEP, at that time we already think like how I will evaluate and how I should know when uh, my IP is being achieved, right? So this is a thing that, that we have to uh, I think it's, it's a different uh, component, but we have to think in a once. Then other things when we think about the uh, curriculum, for me is think about why. So one is what, what we teach, what to teach, Second is how, how to teach. The third is why. Why we choose this goal? Why we teach this? So when we think about the why, it's really think about the current and final goal of each activities. So for instance, when I'm thinking that the student right now has a cooking class, 
for student A, I have to think like, what is the goal for him today? Am I want him to count the five chili? And then what is the goal for the next six months? Oh, I um, wanted the child learn concept of tent, but I am using um, um, the activities of cooking because the cooking is important for the life now, tomorrow, and for the future. So I'm combining about many things in the one activities. So now I know that the cooking for this child, because he's, uh, he is 15 years old, is important. Because I know that this, uh, this skill is useful for him now and next time, because I want in the future that this child or this student, or when he become young man, he will be able to have uh, to live independently. So I know that this teaching, the cooking is very important. Then I know it is a fun for the student because this is based on the current uh, ability and um, in the uh, uh, academic level. It is also realistic because I know that he can do it, but then I only give the challenge a little bit. I know it is important, yeah? And I know it's appropriate for the age. So when we think about the why, of choosing um, the right goal or right curriculum, think this uh, component. I would challenge you to think your uh, program, to review your program. Could you answer all these questions? If you could answer this question, then excellent, right? But when I say it's appropriate, I'll, I'll ask you to wait. What I mean by age appropriate, because later we will discuss more in the teaching strategy. Okay. So those are what, how, and why for me is a curriculum. So the right curriculum, the content of the curriculum is not in the book, but is in the child current level, is in my dream, is in the, in the parent hope and expectation, is in the opportunity we have. So for me, that's part of the curriculum because the curriculum for these children must be individual. It's different from each kid, as you already learned before, that each kid are different, that the combination of disability that they have create the unique needs uh, for each kid, right? Okay, so, so now I would like to offer you the meaningful curriculum for this uh, student. It's sometimes also called as a functional curriculum. And when I say the functional curriculum or activities, uh, functional activities, don't be so confused. They are almost the same. Right, uh, moderator, please let me know when the time are uh, almost up, yeah? Like, sure. uh, Miss Manny, yeah? there's a question for you. Okay, okay great. Uh, there's a question uh, from one of the participants. I have a question here. What can I do to encourage my children to participate in learning activities actively? Because sometimes they refuse to explore the things I give them. They are a little bit passive compared to normal children? That's a question. Great question. Uh, thank you. I love that. So, <laughs> so uh, this could be fun and this can be challenged. Um, you see, uh, last time when we said that some children don't have trust the people and uh, because of that, then children become so passive because they think that, oh, there is, some children think that people are mean to me because they just make me surprised or because something else or because actually we um, intend, um, we have the intention to uh, play with them but they don't understand so they have the misunderstanding and then the children become so passive 
or other things is because they do not know anything around them. So then they're just like, okay, I'll just be here. The other thing that make the student passive is that often because the environment be a fairy for them. I do not know if my English makes sense. So fairy mean like there is a person who always help them. The world is magic for them, right? So for in sun, like when uh, the children, the children um, hungry and then they're just crying, then food come. Or when the children do something, um, then the children just do something, then everything they want is coming. Um, so all of this possibility make the, uh, the children become uh, passive. So what, what I could do is really kind of be with the kid, right? And explore together with the kid. Explore together mean not only instruct the kid to do something, but it's really go together with the kid. Every explore object, object, then bring the child hand together with you to explore the object and explain, feel that, and explain what is the object and then try to explore, maybe to open it together, maybe smell, uh, smell it together, maybe use it together. And so be fun with that. This is also a way for you to build trust to this kid. If you want to invite the kid to move somewhere, um, explore um, a different place, and if the kid know um, a speech, that is good. So that you can just invite the kid to go with you together, um, do something fun in that uh, different place. But if the kid doesn't speak, um, bring something from that place and then present to the kid and then uh, allow the kid to explore, then go together with the kid. So this is, this is a way, for me, this is a way that always works um, to invite the kid. And sometimes there is a kid that, that is very uh, passive and rigid, even like push you away, right? Because uh, I have, I worked with the one student before that he didn't trust to people at all. So basically when people come to her, him, he uh, put the uh, hand like um, inside the skirt and really uh, um, lock her himself. So what I did is we just sat next to him and I didn't say anything. I just allow him, uh, let him know that I am there and I'm available for him. And took, it took a day and sometimes it's more than a day for me to just sit there and, you know, I'm here. If you need me, touch my hand. And every time when I close to him, he would just turn over and then sometimes he really move away. But then eventually he even be a great um, a student. He engage with everything, but it's take time. So it really depends on how much um, the, let's say the trauma for the student, but try to do that. Is that answer the question? Thank you, Ms. Renisi. Okay, you, uh, you still have until one o'clock for your session. Okay. So yeah, if, do you want to uh, start your I activity? can continue. Yeah, or interact okay. with the participants, you may do so. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would love like, you know, if they have a question so far or, mm. or something, um, that would be a uh, great. I would like okay. to know also. There's, yeah, there's one here from I think Pangeran uh, Rohani Haji Abdullah from Brunei. Okay, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. Okay, is it maybe you want to ask the questions? You can turn on your microphone. Or should I just read the questions? Okay, so for students with visual impairment, not multi disabled, I mean, who are able students, are they, can they follow the regular curriculum? That's the question. Right. I think so. If they're only visual impairment, they should use the regular curriculum. But you just need to 
um, to modify, for instance, the textbook, or uh, if their low vision is just to modify the learning media, like uh, making sure that, that they can't uh, access the books. But uh, otherwise, you really definitely could use the uh, regular curriculum. So that's why the student with only visual impairment, they should be in the mainstream school with the, with the support. Um, I think it's easier for them, but yes, you, you need some accommodation um, so that they could really um, uh, fully participate in, in the school. A very good question and a very good feedback. Yes. Thank you, Miss Manny. It's a really nice question. Sama -sama. Okay, there's one from Nurul Huda. How about to handle student with visual impairment with ADHD? Mm. Hmm. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, um, if you, uh, uh, if I could work with you like uh, in another two months, probably we can prove it <laughs> to work with the kid. But I think that one that I would like to um, to say that uh, later we will discuss about the teaching strategy, but um, uh, the other thing that I want to say is really kind of that that um, try to first is really uh, try to uh, help him uh, engage in the meaningful uh, activities. So it's a meaningful is something that interesting interesting for him. Um, but also if it's ADHD, uh, there is time where you need to um, release the, um, the uh, stress or the needs to move. And you should know like how much the student actually needs to release the um, uh, distress, also the need, the natural need for, uh, for him. But other thing is really to, um, to decrease the distraction. And uh, sometimes the children with uh, a visual impairment and ADHD, uh, if their low vision is really think about uh, how much clutter that you can have in, in your classroom. Um, maybe you have to think like, what is the sitting, sitting, sitting position, the best sitting position uh, for him. You have also the thing about like, um, you know, how about the noise in the, in the classroom? Uh, because all of those components can really be distracted for the, the student. The other thing that is very important is really to think about the uh, um, routine activities that the student can anticipate, um, really can know. Uh, so you have to develop the, the schedule that and there is a routine uh, um, schedule, but also there is kind of main schedule that the children can anticipate. But, but again, that um, be really creative to really think and follow what the child uh, interest um, and need and, and also engage uh, into the meaningful uh, activities. Then the other things like the uh, set environment setting and everything, um, you really have to uh, just modify to decrease the distraction um, as much as possible. And you should learn like what are the some uh, element uh, that distract this kid because sometimes uh, it's different from uh, cat to cat, but definitely sound, lighting, colors, you know, uh, have to arrange your, your, your uh, classroom, um, be very organized. That is something that will help the kid. Hmm. Yeah, thank you, Miss Venisi. Okay, that's a question from uh, teacher Suti Sapadi from Thailand. What should be done when children get upset and express emotionally? towards what I am teaching or offering to them. So what should be done? Okay, that's a great question. And I love about feelings because uh, as I also believe that the children have feeling and have right to express their feeling, right? Um, uh, I think that we have to know like why the student upset. Um, is it because it's the, the uh, activities is too difficult for him? or it is, it is uh, too easy, or uh, it is um, you know, uh, too much, or it is not something that he likes, right? So first we have to know uh, what is the reason why he upset, or is it because of the environment? So we have to really kind of evaluate uh, everything to be able to really kind of um, think about the right uh, approach uh, for him. The other thing is that I, if 
he can talk, and then I would ask Paul would ask him to share the feeling instead of stop what he's doing, but really share the feeling in the proper way. But if he is not verbal, he doesn't speak. I would like to uh, teach him about how to express their feeling in the proper way. Um, so for instance, like it's the student uh, to say um, that I'm angry, <laughs> yeah, with a picture or with something so that we know. Uh, so talking about feeling in the morning is very important. And feeling is very abstract, but everyone, including children with multiple disabilities, have to learn. So it's really kind of talk about feeling in the morning before we begin the classroom and have the conversation about that is, is important. And model to them how to express feeling. When I was still a teacher, sometimes I talk to them like, oh, today I'm so sad because something. So I have to say, um, uh, only, not only because I'm, you know, I'm happy or I'm sad, but I have to say to them why I'm happy. And I might sometimes say like, oh, okay, okay I'm mad to you. So I just need a few, a few seconds. I will leave you here. When I feel good, I will come back to you. So by then I model to them like, you can get upset, you can mad, but you don't have to uh, bang your head. You don't have to pull somebody hair. Um, this is the way. Some children who understand the picture, I could discuss about the feeling and then uh, ask them to choose what, 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 do you, what, do you, what are you feeling today? I usually start from myself. Oh, today I'm happy. Um, yeah, with, with the uh, symbol of happy. Today I'm sad because of something, right? And what about you? What do you feel today? Why? So have a discussion in the morning and after, you know, when we about finish the, um, the school, that is something important. So I would say like, uh, don't be panic if the student uh, uh, get upset and you may take some time um, because this is something that again, abstract to build the communication way or the way how they could express the feeling, but keep talking about that feeling. But again, understand like why, why mm -hmm. the children get upset. That is all other thing that we have to think. Okay, thank you, Miss Wenny. There's a question from Cikgu Yunus. How is the method of teaching visually impaired students who have been who have just been diagnosed with a visual impairment? Okay, good. Mm -hmm. But that is really tough um, for the student. Like how old the student? Do you have any information? Uh, it's not stated here. Cikgu Yunus, how old is the student, please? Wow, we have so many questions. Good. Great. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Did you say, can you know how many? Uh, how old is your student, please? <laughs> oh, okay, we're waiting for Chico Yunus to uh, respond on the age. While while waiting, I oh, would waiting. say like, yeah. I would say like please it's be with with them, right? Uh, that that is the important and let let him know that we support them and uh, we are with with him. It is very difficult for the kid. It's not only uh, psychologically dif difficult, but you know, a being from the um, uh, uh, you know, cited to be visual impairment is really difficult, right? I do not know, probably, probably here there is a friend um, who uh, become visual impairment when they're older, but from what I hear from some friends, that is really difficult. So first, that is really understand uh, from two years and now, uh, okay, so it is very young, yeah? So, um, Ever is very young. I think. Uh, he's actually 14 from in Malaysia. Form 2 is a uh, 14 year old. 
Oh, so those 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 kids are fourteen years old. Fourteen years old, yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. this is tough time for this student. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't immediately did something to him, but emotionally being with him first really making sure that they feel, they don't feel alone. And after they're ready, then teach them technical things. But I don't want to um, in hurry teach the technical things to them because that is really hard for them. Just really take time to um, make him comfortable first. I would also um, uh, probably like, like have the psychology uh, people to be with them, but uh, and also um, uh, engage him with the with other friend who's not who's not always who are blind, but also other friends, so that making sure that he is not losing um, the uh, activities that he enjoy before or before um, he still have the uh, good vision. Make sure that we have to adapt, like how. Um, what kind of thing that we can modify so that he still can uh, join the um, activities that he enjoyed before so that he didn't think that the whole world is being upside down. So, so I think that the best support is, is really how to create um, the um, understanding about the activities that, that he engaged and he enjoyed before and then how to modify as much as possible. And then also let him know that we are available and we support him. And then um, uh, later when uh, he found that there are some difficulties, then we offer um, a kind of new technique or something. Yeah, but but it's, it is transition time uh, for him, particularly like probably you need um, six months, one year, uh, that, that's fine. But but taking care of the feeling is more important in the first year. And then later when, when he's ready, then uh, you teach the technical things to him, but really kind of teaching the uh, to be being independent, how, you know, before like these children will have pride. It's very important to, to let him know that he will not lose his pride. So um, uh, really kind of uh, teach them kind of, kind of techniques so that he, not losing the pride. That's what I could say right now. Thank you, Ms. Venice. I hope uh, that uh, clarifies to Chikgu Yunus. Okay, next question is from Teacher City Khalija Muhammad Farid. I have students with ADHD. It is very challenging to put them together with me to do activities in class. So, yeah. Right. So uh, this is like uh, in a special school or in the regular school, and you know, like how many students in the classroom? Uh, it's not stated here, uh, Teacher Siti Khalija. You can you can open your microphone and uh, give some. Yeah, you can just give direct uh, questions to Miss Wenisi. Oh, Chiku, you know, say thank you to Miss Manisi for the answering the question. Sama sama. <laughs> uh, oh, perhaps yeah. while we wait for Chiku Siti Kalija uh, yeah. to uh, reply, there's another question from Teacher Siti Atika. Okay, it's quite long here. So, during this pandemic, one of my MDVI students could not involve during the online class because he has difficulties in hearing and seeing the screen. So it's mild deaf blindness. But when it is time for us to come back to school, the family seems worried about the SOP, such as social distancing and wearing masks at school. So he is still staying at home. We are worried about his development because his mother complained he started talking to himself and have insomnia. Do you have any suggestion about this situation? Yeah, um, it is. Thank you. It is tough situation for both uh, family and children, but also for you as a teacher. Um, and I love because this is a Jafran student. Actually, Jafran is my, let's say, my passion. <laughs> yeah. Um, so first that I would like, to say it is really confusing for this for the student, particularly when see when the student 
um, have non-verbal communication because he definitely doesn't know everything is confusing um, in the beginning. And then now it's soon maybe it, have, uh, it will have another confusion uh, where they will come to the school with a different uh, routine, different protocol, which everything is different. So what I would like to say is build, um, prepare the student by build the routine that's, that you will have in the school to the student. So for instance, and, and this is being done with, with uh, so many teachers that I work with, is when you will have the protocol like, um, you know, having a mask on every time. So you have to teach the student at home while at home to put the mask like, you know, in a certain day so that uh, he understand that later when at school, um, you is getting familiar with, with the mask. And then um, second is really what other routine? So you have to list it. What is the a new routine that you will have in your school better? And then try to uh, apply at home. So that's that's prepare the student for this uh, new um, a new routine. Um, and then uh, uh, second, and I think this is important. I do not know what is the nature of your uh, schedule or your teaching with the student, but. For um, many of the job line and also the MDVI is actually, they need to work in the functional activities. And this is what I'm going, going to uh, share um, in the next uh, few minutes. It, it's really kind of because if they only learn from the screen, definitely they will not understand. And we have really to think about um, uh, how to make the student active, but also learn the concept. Because, because um, uh, if, the screen like this is really abstract for them. For myself, even uh, it is it's really different feedback, different feeling when I'm talking uh, in front of the laptop, as you may experience, right? Because there is no feedback. I'm not talking with myself, like you know. And um, but the children even difficult because they really do not know anything. If the students still have the little hearing, it's hard to hear. If they only have the little vision, it's really hard to see what is the screen. And most of them, this is abstract. What is this? So we have to create the different activities. And, and this is not only in, at home, but I really hope also at school, but the children need the different program, different curriculum. And uh, if you want to um, um, inserting, for instance, the uh, academic is must be the functional ac academic that is really meaningful so that the student understand um, because all of those things are so abstract and they just, okay, they just maybe say it, they just be maybe nice out there, but they might not learn. So you have to really, we have really to think about what is, what what's, how this, this student really can learn. It's not only attend the a class or attend the Zoom, but the, the a can learn. So I would really kind of think about the activities at home, for instance, like, you know, what is the mom actually uh, uh, have the activities? What is the um, father actually have the activities? What is the sibling? So I know that the nature of a mother, for instance, who are at home, they may uh, cook, they may do laundry, they may clean the house, they may uh, shopping. So I would ask the, uh, the student to uh, be involved in the activity, but I will make sure to, pro, um, to uh, make the uh, learning media so that if the student is in the, um, um, uh, you know, in the lab, uh, have the, you know, um, uh, reading the reading or writing the uh, sentence, for instance. So I will make sure before um, uh, going to the uh, shop, he need to, to write or to read about, you know, the shopping list. Uh, and then uh, in the shopping, he could really select which one based on the uh, uh, shopping list that, that he has to take. When uh, coming home and you maybe you think about the math, he can count like what, what is the price of each item if that is in his level mm. and how much they spend. So those kind of things that, that, that you have to think through. So don't ask the student to sit um, in front of the screen. Okay, Miss Mary. Next question. Uh, this is a very important question here from Mr. Nasro Hisham from Malaysia. How to handle blind students that shows 
inappropriate sexual behavior, such as sexual harassment towards normal or typical student? Great. <laughs> Great. <laughs> oh, I also love this. Somebody said, uh, Chik Siti Atika. Chik Siti Atika said that Tiaf Ban is all fashion. Okay. Great. So, yeah. Wow. That question finally uh, uh, came. <laughs> I'm really glad. I'm sometimes kind of hesitant. Like, is it appropriate for me to say that? But yes, that is, that is a, the, another challenge of this. So, I might well uh, share um, um, experience, um, not to tell you which one is right, but maybe you, will, you could take um, uh, some lesson from this. So there was a time that uh, when I was working in a school and I have the, a young student, he was just, I think seven, and he enjoyed himself like, you know, when he grabbed the bottle and then he put on his private and then he plays with and then he just enjoyed it and nobody can stop that, right? And that's happened for a long time and people just keep trying to stop and beat him and get everything to stop that, right? And then another time there was a young uh, adult teenager, he was 10. Well, 10, it's not the teenager, but 10 or 11. And he also loved and have a fantasy for uh, that. And also using the bottle. <laughs> so that, that is the thing. Then we keep learning about, you know, um, uh, because every time everybody say that has stopped. And in Indonesia, you know that, that some people say that it's uh, inappropriate. But the children doesn't understand what is appropriate and not appropriate, right? This is something that's totally abstract. So we, we uh, start to uh, think about, okay, if this child is really obsessed to uh, the bottle, first that we can do is uh, remove the bottle uh, from um, um, the place where <laughs> reachable um, or feasible uh, from him. That is something that I thought it's work, but then always there is opportunity. But then the big thing that, that I also learned is that these children might feel bored at first and they seek uh, something within themselves that is really enjoyable, right? And they found that. So then if we think from that, we also have to think like, what are other activities that that is really fun for him, but is not really directly uh, kind of replace that, but immediately or like eventually, we just give them option to um, to use their time to do something else that which which really fun, right? And that is work for them. So instead, then we 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 really that we not allow the children to have a lot of. Um, break time or the boring uh, activities or boring time, but we engage them with the different activities that is really motivated to them. And eventually they forgot this thing. So we didn't really kind of um, stop and beat the kid anymore uh, since then. The other thing is really kind of to allow the child to have the schedule that allow them to think that, oh, there are other things that are fun today uh, so that they're looking forward uh, then they also uh, eventually reduce this. For them who are young adults, and this is to be, you know, I know that some people against this idea, but for me, like, you know, there are some things that, that, that we cannot really remove things, but we have to allow the child to understand where this can be appropriate and where that is not appropriate, right? So um, there was time the, the, when the young adult was really obsessed to that and he's big, so people cannot really you know, stop him. But then we teach them to put on a schedule. Before it was like every time, like every time when I say every time is every 10 minutes and that's bother everyone, right? And then, then we put that on the schedule first. Okay, like give it like every an hour, then eventually move to every day. Then eventually 
it was surprised because it by um, uh, uh, himself that he stopped it. When we uh, put a schedule, mean that he can do that, but in the uh, right place. Mm -hmm. We asked him to do it in the bathroom and with a man, <laughs> not with the uh, um, woman teacher. Yeah, I mean, like, like there is a man who supervised that. So make sure, okay, done, finished. Now back to the classroom, but clean it up. Yeah, um, then, um, so then eventually it's really gone. So within, I think it was within six months that it's gone. So this is really kind of, I know that this might be extreme, but it's work. Yeah. And again, it's respect that, well, I don't know what to say, but uh, uh, but that, that is the, the, the fact that there are some things that we have to accept, but we teach them um, how to do properly. Miss Wendy, there are actually five more questions here in the chat box. Oh, and they are all great questions from teachers from Brunei, Malaysia here. Okay, so, um, and we only have five minutes left. So, uh, what do you think? Um, what about like this? <laughs> what about like this? Mm. Um, one that could you, uh, uh, Miss Ayla, could you um, put in the, um, um, in the file, like write for me and then uh, probably later um, I'll try to answer uh, by right. So uh, maybe not today, yeah. Uh, so just please uh, collect it and then uh, maybe cl uh, cluster it if that there are a similar question mm -hmm. so that you can send to me and hopefully I, I will arrange time to answer that and then send to you so that it could um, send to the friends who ask that how about that okay, sure yeah, yeah because, because i i'm going to talk uh, after the break i'm going to talk about the curriculum development and, email. Yeah. and then mm -hmm. because this is i think this is the core of our uh uh training uh, and then that that's after that we could um uh work in a group okay okay yeah so can i please have those who ask the questions to also state your email address here so Miss Wendy can reply to this. Oh, Chris, mm -hmm. yes, I remember the story of Yusuf and Ranga. That's unreal. That's great. I am glad you came to that session. And yes, how much different uh, that we can do for the child. We can we can really ruin the uh, life of the child, but we can really create the future uh, of the child. So everything is partially on our hand, you really can make difference to the life of the children. 